If you look around, this is what our church looked like eight years ago when I retired. Most of the people here now are, are from then. And when I come on Sundays, I've been retired eight years. And when I come on Sundays now, four out of five people are new. And I, I, don't, I have to get to know them. Whereas today, four out of five have been here. And I recognize everybody because, oh, you've got a little grayer. But, <laughs> but the young people, like a couple back here, and, and this guy here, they're, both, they're all giants now. And I don't I don't. Gonna... <laughs> so I gave this sermon 10 years ago. I've updated it, but it was essentially 10 years ago. And if, it brings to mind when I first gave a sermon that I had done before at this church. I apologized, and I said, I'm really sorry, you've heard this before. And then after the service, one of, the, one of you came up to me and said, oh, don't worry, Charlie, we don't remember anything you say. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, <laughs> so this particular message rose out of two questions that I was wrestling with. One question was, since I rejected my upbringing, I was born and raised a Baptist, and I rejected almost everything from that. So I was, I was wrestling with the idea of what am I keeping, what am I holding on to from my days as a Baptist that's worthwhile to me? And um, I had three questions. One was uh, uh, giving a tithe. I, I, te- I gave 10%. I learned in the Baptist church, and I gave 10% when I was a UU. The other was the altar call. The altar call was, you know, almost every Baptist service ends with come forward if you believe in Jesus and you come forward and you're saved. And I don't do that anymore, but I believe that it's a good idea to ask people to stand up for what they believe in. That's, that's why I think it's an altar call. And, and the third thing is, and this led to this particular message today, I have salvaged from the Bible which I used to believe was the inerrant word of God. Now I just believe it's a good, good book. I, I saved from that some of the things that were meaningful to me in my childhood. And, and so the other question is, since I've rejected a lot of what I used to believe in, and, it was, and that's what used to support me in times of struggle, what do I now believe in that supports me in times of struggle? So this is what this sermon's about. For many years, the 23rd Psalm provided me comfort in times of personal stress and is helpful to me when mourning people I love who died. I chose the Psalm as part of the memorial service, many of the memorial services that I led while I was minister here. I usually used the 23rd Psalm as as a prayer. It was also recited at the funeral for my father at the Baptist church, and for my mother that I led at, at the Baptist church, but which I led, and I used the 23rd Psalm. This goes back to my Baptist roots. Psalm 23 remains a source of comfort for me. I have, in essence, learned to translate the psalm into my own personal words and images. The, an example would be the humanist version of the 23rd Psalm. That's an example of how I've retooled it for my use. I believe that most people have a deep-seated need, a spiritual need, to feel a sense of belonging in the world. As a matter of fact, that's what I, how it is, I describe spirituality. Spirituality is a sense of belonging. You have in the world, with other people, and in here. That's a spirituality. We want to believe in a power or force or spirit larger than ourselves that can hold our individual brokenness and suffering. We need to believe in inherent natural force for good. Remember Martin Luther King Jr. said, I believe that the arc of justice bends towards justice. He was talking about that. He was talking about his belief that there was an inherent urge towards good within the fabric of life. The 23rd Psalmist, according to tradition, was David. The Psalms... In Jewish, well, they are, they're Jewish. What they are is the Jewish songs. Lamentations, oh, woe is me, you know, like sorrow. Praises, praise to God. Thanksgiving, this is what the Psalms are. We do not know for certain who the author of Psalm 23 was, but we do know the author visualized God as a king. So, you know, it could have been David because that was part of his future. Kings were called shepherds. 
of their people back then. So a king was a shepherd. So this is the imagery of the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. God, God is my shepherd. He prayed to a shepherd king. The spirit of life, so, so he, the first line, you are my shepherd, I shall not want. The spirit of life guides me. I am sustained by its power. I have all that I need. I want nothing more. This is what this says. Greed, greed is wanting more, more than what you need. Or what you have is not enough. That's what greed is. Well, in the 23rd Psalm, hey, I have enough. When I hear these words, I think of Donald, Donald, Donnell Meadows' testimony. This is, I'm quoting Donnell Meadow. There is a part of me, it feels as if it's buried deep, that shines. It literally shines, or so it seems to me, with a warm, steady glow. It is where my deepest wisdom and best instinct come from. That part of me seems, in a way I cannot explain, and I was trained as a scientist, this I'm quoting from this person, I squirm at things I can't explain. To me, simultaneously, inside of me and beyond me, this, this, this is what he, he's describing as spiritual. It is connected to the whole universe. It is ancient, loving, noble. It is what other people mean when they use the words like conscience or soul or God. Something deep in here. Ralph Waldo Emerson expressed it this same thing in this way. He said, within us is a soul of the whole. By the way, he took this from Hinduism, the idea of the God is, he didn't use the word God, but God is Atman, which is oversoul, and then we all have in here a smaller soul, and so that's how we're part of God, and, and we are God, because we're, this, so this is from Emerson. Within us is the soul of the whole, the wise silence, the universal beauty, to which every part and particle is equally related, the eternal one, capital O, the eternal one, you are my shepherd. I shall not want. I have everything I need. I trust in life itself to be sufficient. The original Hebrew translation of this is, I shall, I shall lack for nothing. I shall lack for nothing. That's probably what the meaning of thanksgiving is. I'm thankful for what I have. I lack nothing. When I say these words, I turn my focus on what I have instead of what I seemingly lack. I have everything I need and want. That is a prayer of gratitude. Thanksgiving. I shall not feel deprived or diminished if I do not get what I yearn for because I know how blessed I am with what I have. You make me to lie down in green pasture. The green earth, this is one of the earliest um, ecological prayers. That, you know, this is ecology way back then. The green earth provides me with lavish nourishment. To lie down in green pastures is to feel at home in the world, to be connected to the rest of nature, to feel the interdependent web of life of which we all are, are all a part. This is what, how you use put it. We're a part of the interdependent web of life. In, go into nature, lie down next to a stream, be quiet, observe the trees and life with the eyes of your heart. Let the blue skies lift your soul. You laid me beside still waters. Cool, still pools of water refresh my spirit. Water is life. Water is life. This is why we're looking for water someplace else, because life requires water. We're interested. Is, is there water out there? Our first nine months of life, in fact, are nurtured in water. We spend the first nine months of our life in a mother in water. Rain brings life to the earth. It is life itself. In Hebrew, still waters means waters of rest and relaxation. Remember now that the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, were written pretty much in deserts. And so water was very, very primal. You restore my soul. I shall take time out for my business to be quiet, meditate, and rest. A group of tourists on safari in Africa reported that after three days of trekking through the jungle, the native porters and guides announced they would stop for a day of rest. So the, here's the tourists, and they're being, you know, in the, three days, they go, okay, we're going to take a day off. 
The tourists assumed that the porters were too tired to go on because of their physical exertion. No, no, they explained. We have walked too far, too fast, and now we must wait for our souls to catch up. <laughs> this, is why we, this is why we meditate. This is why we need quiet. We have the same need. We need downtime. They call it the Sabbath. You know, the one out of seven days. Don't work. Rest. Enjoy yourself. To rest, restore your soul. Human souls are nourished by love, by relationship. That is why we need time for prayer, silence and healing, mediated through friends and other good people to restore our souls. It is like an emotional filling station. When we are emotionally empty, we stop for a spiritual fill-up. And you can't get filled up if you're not a little bit empty. That's why I meditate, so I can empty part of me so I can get something new in there. You guide me in paths of righteousness, for you are righteous. A deep inner knowing keeps me on a path that is true for the sake of life itself. The Hebrew word, paths of righteousness, means to be guided in straight paths. It literally means, now get this now, so you have a straight path, right? But get this now, in, in the literal Hebrew is, in roundabout ways, they'd end up in the right place. Now, it's not a straight line, it's like this, but you end up in the right place. In other words, I trust that through all the twists and turns of my life, all the false starts and all my errors, which I may go over and over, in the end my life is on the right path and things will come out right. Paths of righteousness. It is like following the Tao, T-A-O, Tao. In Taoism, there is a way, a life, a force, the Tao, and when I get in touch with that and align my life with it, align my life with the Tao, I'll be on the true path for me and life will be fulfilled, despite the twists and turns. So if you're a Taoist, you trust that you're going to end up in the right place as long as you follow the path. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though I struggle through a valley of dark shadows, not sure of where my life is leading, fearful and uncertain, the Hebrew, mean word, the Hebrew words mean that even when I'm walking in deep darkness, this is what, what it means in the original Old Testament, dark, deep darkness. Personally, I have abiding faith that death is a part of life and helps our lives make what sense it does. When I was younger, of course, I was insulted that I had to die. But when I got older, I figured, hey, I don't need to live forever. I fear only painful death, and I have faith also that I shall have the courage and resources to face even that and to give meaning to that. I really am afraid of dying painfully, but I also have the trust that I can find the resources to give that meaning. I fear only wasting my life while I am alive. I have been through dark tunnels, the, the valley of the shadow of death, and I've come out on the other side. I know whenever I enter a dark tunnel, there will be light at the end. This is one thing I, when I was counseling people and they'd say, you know, they're deeply depressed or whatever, I would always say to them, try to remember what it was that got you out of it the last time. Go back to that. Go back to Have faith that you can do that. I walk through the valley. Hope rises from the ashes of despair. Knowing the earth will land in flames six billion years from now, so why we bother? Right? Six billion years from now is all going <laughs> to... A child in one of Woody Allen's fams, films, Woody Allen's films, exclaimed, what is the point of doing homework? We're all going to be dead six million years from now. We have that choice. We can say that since death is inevitable, what is the point? Or we can choose life. We can say, I shall make the most of every day and live in such a way to be a blessing to other people. By the way, you, you have to give meaning to your life. No one else can tell you what the meaning of life is. And one way to give your life meaning is to live it to bless other people. Wallace Stevens wrote, and I quote, death is the mother of beauty. It is precisely because everything we know will end that we can see so much beauty in life. So you risk loving other people, knowing that the relationship will end in death, because to not risk 
is the same as to choose a living death. If you, don't, if you reject love because you're afraid of losing it, then you're going to be living death. I also have a deep abiding faith that those I love who have died live on in me. Every time I remember somebody, or even some of my mannerisms and some of the things I think and believe, that's how they live on. I keep them alive in my heart, and that is my hope for my life after death. The people that I have touched will, will somehow keep my, my life alive. So in essence, what the psalmist is saying is, do not be afraid to love people, to give your heart away. Though love inevitably, inevitably brings pain, do not be afraid of the pain of losing, whether it is the prospect of your own death or someone you love. Trust that others you know will enter your pain with you and make it more endurable. Move on, taking one step at a time, no matter how dark the valley is. By the way, to me, this is the message of, the message of Christianity is that no matter how bad your life gets, Jesus is walking beside you. And so you're not alone. No wonder people, no wonder there's half a billion Christians. I mean, that, that is very helpful. I fear no evil, for you are with me. Even though I struggle through the valley of dark shadows, not knowing where life finally ends in death, I will overcome my fear, for I am gladdened by the wise counsel of friends, and I have deep faith in life. There's good and evil in this world. I myself am capable of good, and I am capable of evil. I remember when I, when I finally admitted that. I'm capable of doing yes, 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 even what Adolf Hitler did. I have that capability. And if I deny that, then it's very possible that I would do that. I'm not frightened by this. Life is not always fair. Bad things happen to good people and good things to buy. Bad. By the way, this, this sermon was inspired by Kushner, Rabbi Kushner, who wrote, it's one of my favorite books, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? But I think he should have wrote, why do good things happen to bad people? Because this, this troubles me more. Why is, that dri- why is that guy driving a Cadillac and he's a scum? Well, I won't say it. But. <laughs> the psalmist suggests that when we are in pain, our job is to survive and go on living in hope and faith. It is not our job to explain. This, by the way, is, is the main point of Kushner's book. I don't know if you remember, he had a son that died, and he was trying to explain, why does this bad thing happen? I'm a good person. And part of it was, it's not our job to explain to somebody why my son died. It's to give it meaning. We are to affirm life in the face of loss, to affirm good in the face of evil. Your rod and your staff comfort me. Your rod and your staff. Discipline and guidance. The shepherd uses the staff to help fallen sheep climb out of ditches they fall into and to guide them on the way. The shepherd uses the rod to discipline stubborn sheep, sheep who get out of line and wander into danger. So, so, if, so you should, well, we should welcome both, the rod and the staff. Discipline? Yeah, tell your kid that the next time. You, you lo- I love you, and the fact that I love you, I'm, gonna, I'm using the rod. There is compassion in this world. People who stumble and fall will be held back on their feet. There is justice in the world when people work against evil. You spread a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You soothe my head with oil. My cup runs over. Even in the face of threats to my well-being and my very life, I am nourished by the spirit of life, which is all life and connects us in the web of life. I am upheld by this presence of this spirit. I already have more than my need. My cup is neither half full nor half empty. My cup runs over. Psychologist Abraham Maslow, Maslow said the mature adult has the ability, and I'm quoting, has the ability to appreciate again and again, freshly and naively, the basic goods of life with awe, pleasure, wonder, and even ecstasy rather than take them for granted. This is, quote, unquote. Uh, we get so jaded, we forget. And we, we forget, you know, the basic things of life. Maslow wrote a book in which he talked about the basic need. What are the basic needs? And after this, then, then we can talk about other things. But you have to need, fulfill your basic needs. 
Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in your house forever. Goodness and kindness fill me. I am at home in this universe, which birthed me with its transforming power for as long as I live. As you, you know, if you've heard me speak before, one of my spiritual models was Vincent van Gogh. I, I, his life and he just inspires me. He had a deep abiding faith, and he walked through a long, dark valley of darkness. In fact, his, most of his life was a valley of darkness. He was so deeply religious, get this now, Van Gogh was so deeply religious that while he was in divinity school studying to be a minister, he gave away everything he owned, including his clothing, to the poor. That's what the Bible said. That's what Jesus said to do. He was following Jesus' teaching. He was filled with compassion for other people. And because of that, he got thrown out of seminary because he was going to make a lousy minister. We do not know for certain the nature of the mental illness Van Gogh suffered whether it resulted from, some people speculate, venereal disease, some speculate alcoholism, some that it was bipolar disorder. We do know that his dark valley included self-mutilation, he cut off his ear, and that it led him at times to eat tubes of paint. No, he didn't know it, but we know that that's a short way to death. He ended an asylum seeking help. He felt, quote, delivered from his sufferings by the compassionate doctors. When he went in after he cut his ear off, the doctors' compassion brought him back to a sense. The attendants and the nuns of the Good Samaritan Asylum, that's where he has put the Good Samaritan Asylum, there he discovered newfound hope. After leaving the asylum and letters to his brother Theo, Vincent Van Gogh wrote, I must continue on the path I have taken. If I don't do anything, if I don't study, if I don't go on seeking any longer, I am lost. That is how I look at it. To continue, to continue, that is what is necessary. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. This is Van Gogh. In a letter to his brother, Vincent continued, reflecting on his passage, on the passage through the dark valley, What has changed is that my life then was less difficult and my future seemed less dark, but my inner state, my way of looking at things and my way of thinking has not changed. If there has been any change, it is that I think and believe and love more seriously now than what I already thought and believed and loved then. You look at his paintings after this this incident and you can just see the new life. You can just see it. You restore my soul, you guide me in paths of righteousness, for you are righteous. Vincent van Gogh said, quote, I always think that the best way to know God is to love many things. Want to know God? Love. Love a friend, a wife, something. Whatever you choose, you will be on your way to knowing more about God. One must love with a lofty and serious, serious intimate sympathy, with strength, with intelligence, and one must always try to know deeper, better, and more. That leads to unwavering faith. This is the guy that's almost near the, he's near the end of his life. He's going to die soon. You guide me in paths of righteousness. You rod on your staff, comfort me. You soothe my head with oil. Another thing that Vincent Van Gogh said, a man who's been tossed back and forth for a long time as in a stormy sea, and of course he's talking about himself, at last reaches his destination. A man who has seemed good for nothing and incapable of any employment, any function, ends in finding one and becoming active and capable of action. End quote. He's talking about himself. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all days of my life. Van Gogh said, do you know what frees one from this captivity to darkness? It is every deep, serious affection. Being friends, being brothers and sisters, love. That's what opens the prison by some supreme power, some magic force. His brother, by you, I think you know the story of Van Gogh, but the only support he got through his adult life was his brother Theo, who sent him money, sent him painting supplies, probably bought the only painting that Van Gogh ever sold in his lifetime. But he was his support. His brother loved him. He loved his brother. You can tell by reading Vincent's letters to his brother. 
Shortly after leaving the Good Samaritan, it was called an asylum. It wasn't called a hospital. Vincent van Gogh painted a painting he called The Good Samaritan. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but the Samaritan already treated the victim's wound. You know the story of the Good Samaritan. You know, everybody went, went walking by the person in the, in the ditch, and the Good Samaritan, who was supposed to hate Jews, stopped and, and ministered to this person. And he had already treated the wounds of the person in the ditch with oil and wine and bandaged up the head. The bandage alludes to the one Van Gogh himself wore in the self-portrait he did while recuperating from the self-inflicted ear and injury. So this painting, if you go back home and take, look up at the painting of the Good Samaritan by Van Gogh, that's really him. Head all bandaged up. The horse in, in the painting signifies self-sacrifice and compassion. If you lived back then, you'd know that that's what that was. It was self-sacrifice and compassion. Vincent van Gogh, not yet fully out of his tunnel of darkness, tells us in this painting that the answer to pain is compassion to and from others. Not just receiving compassion, but giving compassion. We know that shortly after this, van Gogh took his own life. I do not believe this tragic ending is the last word because I don't believe that death is the final answer. Van Gogh is alive today in the hearts and minds of millions of people. How can you look at a painting of Van Gogh and not believe you're keeping him alive in that way? And he touches me deeply, his paintings, his compelling story, and his compassion. And I will dwell in your house forever.